my on? I know it's turned on back here. You got a signal there? All right, testing you go. Oh, good evening. Um, it's an honor to be here with you. I appreciate you guys showing up because if you weren't here, it'd be pretty boring for me. As I've, I've heard me before. It's not that good. Um, but actually, it's a very exciting talk. And you're going to see pretty quickly that even though we're going to be talking about creation and evolution, it's ultimately about the authority of God's word. Amen. That's really the foundation of it. As I travel around, um, and I'll give you my background in just a bit, but as I travel around, I run into a lot of Christians, and I ask them, why do you believe the Bible? Because I'm a Christian. Okay, why are you a Christian? Because I believe the Bible. <laughs> why do you believe the Bible? Because I'm a Christian, and round and round. Okay, but how do you know the Bible is from God? Because I'm a Christian. Like, I know why you believe it, but how do you know that it's the inspired Word of God? Well, it, I just know it is. I, I just believe it as I just, it says it is, you know, all these things, but they really have no concrete answer. And so how strong is their faith going to be, and how are they going to be able to mentor their children or witness to anyone? Um, so we have these beliefs, and if that's all the farther it goes, it's just a blind faith. And there's no reason anyone else should believe it. If you're not even sure why you believe it, you just do, and you want someone else to. And at that point, you'd be asking them to have faith in you. Say, trust me, do what I'm doing. I can't really tell you why, but just do it. You know, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be guiding people to God's word and being confident as to why we do believe it's the word of God. So with that, um, most of you don't know me from, uh, I don't know, did my little uh, remote get bumped? The little USB thing? If the light is flashing, it's making a connection. If not, there, there we go. Do I have control? Yeah, okay, it looks like I got it now. All right, most of you don't know me from a hole in the ground, so I gave you my background really quick. Uh, that's me. That's a hole in the ground. <laughs> so, <laughs> there are a few differences, maybe not that many. But I was raised in a Christian home, and you can see very clearly that that is a Christian home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, placed my trust in Christ when I was in early grade school years. And I went to public schools all the way through high school. That was me just a couple of years ago. <laughs> when I graduated from high school, I went to a Christian college, John Brown University in Arkansas, to study mechanical, en mechanical engineering. Partway through, I became more interested in physics. Uh, but John Brown didn't have a physics major, just a minor. So I left there in Arkansas and went back to Wisconsin, where I'm from, then went to the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater to get a degree in physics. And that's when my world changed quite a bit going from a small Christian college where my engineering professors opened up every class in prayer to a large state university where my physics professors did not open up in prayer. They were all evolutionists. Some of them were atheists, and they were telling me, in essence, that everything I believed was wrong. And that made me very uncomfortable to be surrounded by these PhD scientists who I assumed had a lot of evidence for what they believed, but I realized for the first time in my life that even though I knew what I believed, I really didn't know why. <laughs> How did I really know that God existed? How did I know the creation account was scientifically valid? That was huge, studying physics. How did I know there was a worldwide flood? How did I know that Jesus was the Son of God? How did I know the Bible was the inspired Word of God? I, I grew up believing all those things. Just didn't know why. So God put it on my heart at that point in my life, my junior year at college, to start looking into these things. So I have been researching and lecturing now for the past 30 years. I can't believe how many years have gone by. Um, and I moved into full-time ministry about uh, a little over nine years ago, traveling around the country. We've gone international too. In fact, in about 10 days, I'll be over in London for a couple weeks speaking throughout the UK. Um, so it's just neat, the opportunities that God has given me to uh, talk about the authority of Scripture. And one thing God told me was, I don't need you. <laughs> There's something I want to do, and if you want to come along, that's fine, but I can replace you in a heartbeat. So <laughs> I know very clearly this has nothing to do with me. It's not about me. It's not about being right or whatever. It's about God wanting to do something, and he chooses to use us. He puts a desire in your heart. He gifts you to do that, and he can use you as long as you're willing and stay out of the way. So <laughs> I just always pray to God, you know, thank you for allowing me to be here and help me to stay out of the way so I don't say anything that is of my own origin, but everything is what God is leading me to say and things that are consistent with Scripture. So that's a little bit of background there. Probably the most important thing I learned when studying physics was this, uh, to never trust an atom because they make up everything. <laughs> now, <laughs> that's just a warning about my really dry sense of humor. It's, it, <laughs> so if you leave, I, I won't complain. Um, here's my family. Actually, that's not my family. It's just a picture of them. 
But uh, my wife is kind of in the white pink there towards the left. My son in the green or yellow. He's 20. He's a junior in college. In fact, he's actually going to the state university uh, where I graduated from. And then my daughter on the left there, Tori, she's 18. She's a freshman in college. And um, my wife, or sorry, myself there on, on the right. We did a Grand Canyon tour in July, which I'll tell you about a little bit more uh, further into the talk. I did mention I'm from Wisconsin. It's a real state, and we love our Packers and our cheese. And uh, it, it gets cold there once in a while. Uh, this was inside my car last winter. It was minus 18. The wind chill was minus 44. <laughs> so you guys have no idea what cold is. You think this is cold, right? <laughs> I, I came to California to warm up. This is, this is nice. So actually, this winter is not too bad. But um, one day, we actually got two feet of snow. So, <laughs> I warn you, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> but it gets warm too. This was a sign by a camp where I was speaking a summer or two ago, 107 degrees. It gets very warm in Wisconsin too. It's, actually, it's a very beautiful state. I, I love the weather. I love living there. I've lived there my whole life. Um, but a little bit about the mission and passion behind the Creation Education Center. It's partially based on this, that we have a problem today. Statistics show us that 50 to 75% or more of Christian students end up walking away from their faith before they leave college. That'd be you guys, <laughs> many of you. Half to three quarters or more are walking away from their faith. How in the world can that be happening? There are a number of factors behind that, but one of the biggest ones is the fact that these students going off to college have a set of beliefs without conviction. It's just you grew up in the church, you do the Jesus thing, you believe the Bible, yeah, it's fine. You, you see your friends at church, it's not too bad. And then you go up to college and you run into professors who are more than willing to tell you why those things can't possibly be true. Like I ran into, there's no way there's a God. I mean, look at all the evil in the world today. I mean, San Bernardino, right? <laughs> what just happened recently? There can't be a God. God wouldn't allow that to happen, right? And the creation account, I mean, nobody believes that anymore. Come on, it's just this old myth from some old dusty book written by some sheep herders or something, you know. We have modern science today. Modern science has proven the Big Bang and proven evolution. And there's no way there was a flood. Where did all that water come from? Where did all that water go? How did Noah get all those animals in that ark? And Jesus, he's not the son of God. And the Bible, this thing is filled with errors and contradictions. There's missing portions of the Bible. There's extra stuff that shouldn't have been in there. There's all these different versions and translations and on and on and on. And students aren't ready for that. Now, not too many students, Christian students, who are really solid in their faith go off to college and walk away when they hear those kind of claims against Christianity. It's usually the students who are kind of iffy to begin with, but we didn't really know that. We just found that out later once they went to college that they weren't too stable to begin with. They had a lot of questions. They were not real thrilled with God about certain things in their life, maybe not too thrilled with their parents, and all these things struggling, and then they get to college, and now the professors give them academic reasons to justify walking away. Kind of wanted to walk away before, but they couldn't. They're living at home, and what are their parents going to say, and their pastor, and their friends, but now they're off in college. They can do whatever they want, and now they have scientific and academic reasons why the whole thing isn't true anyway. Then they go home. They debate their parents. Their parents don't have answers, and they say, yeah, that's what my professor said. You guys don't know what you're talking about, but I'm in college now. And I'm going to get a real degree, a real education, because I live in the real world. I've got to get a real job. I'm forgetting all that Bible myth stuff. I tons of stories that I could share you, real life stories of people that you know, come up to me crying, you know, moms and dads crying, saying that, that was my son, that was my daughter. And they explain what happened. And um, maybe during Q&A, we can talk about some of that a little bit further. But I was speaking at a Christian school, which when I travel around, I, I do a lot of churches and conferences and some camps and then occasionally in some universities. But then I also try to speak at schools. I spoke at Rock Academy on Friday while I was here. Um, this particular school where I spoke went from kindergarten through eighth grade. And I was in there talking to the eighth graders who were getting ready to graduate. Uh, and every single student in this eighth grade class had been raised in this Christian school. So they had a good Christian education. And every single student in this eighth grade class except for one was going to be going on to a public school. One was going to be homeschooled. The rest were going on to a public school because where they were living, they didn't have options for Christian school. So I was in there trying to help them with this major transition in their life. And I asked them a lot of questions along the way. One of the questions I asked them was, how many of you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God? Every hand went up in the room. That's great, but that's not surprising. I mean, you're at a Christian school. If nothing else, out of peer pressure, they're all going to raise their hands. 
Then I asked another question. How many of you can tell me how do you know the Bible is the inspired word of God? It got pretty quiet. And then four hands went up, and these are the responses that I got. Um, because it says it is, because I believe it is, because it was written by God, and because that's what I've been taught. <laughs> you can see very quickly that these aren't really reasons. I, don't want to ask, I won't ask for a show of hands, but very likely there are those of you here tonight that if someone asked you that question, well, how do you really know it's God's word? You might say something similar. I was speaking at a pretty big church once a few years ago. I gave this talk, shared that story. It was eighth grader responses today. This self really. You individually needs to think, what, what would you say if someone asked you, well, how do you know? I gave a whole other talk on that. In fact, I'll talk about our resources at the end, but there's a DVD and a booklet focused on how do we know the Bible is the inspired word of God. And I go over a lot of evidences and things there. Um, but these are things that we need to have in that talk. I, uh, actually, I don't think it's on the DVD. I've tweaked the talk a little bit. I have an excerpt from a radio interview, and the radio show is from an atheist. It's his show, and he's uh, doing this interview, and a pastor calls in. It's just it's stunning to hear, but it just makes the audience realize you know, that they themselves don't really know what they would say about the inspiration of Scripture. So anyway, moving on a little bit, you can ask yourself, how would you or your children, and maybe who created God? And isn't evolution science and creation just religion? Why do so many scientists believe in evolution? Most of them do. Can you really trust a Genesis creation account? Have scientists disproved the Bible? <laughs> Where did all that water go after the flood? That's a real... What about all the ape men? How many of you have ever been to a museum? You've seen the skeletons. You know, a number of you. The rest of you have to get out more often. Um, <laughs> they, they've got real bones. They're standing right there. What are you going to say about that? You know, how do we respond? Was there really an ice age? Did God really create everything in just six days? Does carbon-14 dating disprove the Bible? And where did the races come from? It's been stated that the heart cannot rejoice in what the mind rejoices. How strong are you going to be in your own faith? How eager will you be to share that faith with someone else if you're not quite sure? How well positioned as a parent? And then are you going to start wondering, am I, am I just fooling myself with all this Bible stuff? I mean, science keeps coming up with stuff that disprove it. I know, maybe I just need to have stronger faith. I just kind of grip my teeth harder, and I'm just going to still believe it no matter what. Or bury our heads deeper in the sand. They don't tell me that stuff. I don't care. I don't want to know about it. I just, I just believe the Bible. You know, that's the response of some Christians, and they can do it for a while, but eventually they, they realize how silly that is, and many then end up walking away because they don't have answers, and they don't bother really looking into it. Uh, you may have gotten this handout here. It tears in half. Half of it's a bookmark you can keep, but we have a free monthly email newsletter if you're interested. So anytime during the talk, if you're interested, just fill it out. You can drop it off the table. I also have a clipboard back there if you just want to sign up directly there. You can also go right to our website and just sign up right online if you're interested. But in the newsletter, each month I tackle a different tough question. You know, there's tons I've already gone through in the past, but each month a new question, I throw it out there and then give you the answer. And if something comes out in the news, like they say, oh, they found these gravity waves in space, and that's proof of the Big Bang. And Christians see that, and they're like, gravity what? Ah, you know, I just believe the Bible. <laughs> they don't know how to respond. So I usually have an article on it saying, you know what, this is actually what they found. <laughs> and it's not proof of the Big Bang, it's actually a problem for them, and here's why. So I have a schedule and a bunch of other things. So if you're interested, just fill it out and turn it in the table. Uh, here's an interesting quote from Dr. Richard Rorty from the University of Virginia. Uh, if you're a little sleepy here this evening, this will probably wake you up. This is what he said. He said, secular professors in universities ought to arrange things so that students who enter as bigoted, homophobic, religious fundamentalists will leave college with views more like our own. Students are fortunate to find themselves under the benevolence of people like me and to have escaped the grip of their frightening, vicious, dangerous parents. <laughs> We're going to go right on trying to discredit you parents in the eyes of your children trying to strip your fundamentalist religious community of dignity, trying to make your views seem silly rather than discussable. This is happening at universities and even some high schools all across the country. Direct attacks against Christianity. And many of the students are not prepared for that. And they end up walking away. Then they run into quotes like this from Dr. Ernst Meyer. He was one of the world's leading evolutionists, very intelligent scientist. He said, no educated person any longer questions the validity of the so-called theory of evolution, which we now know to be a simple fact. A very dogmatic statement from a very intelligent scientist. I, I really wouldn't argue with that. He was really smart. 
But the Bible says there's a big difference between intelligence and wisdom. <laughs> the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and many of these scientists, they don't fear God. A lot of them don't even believe in God, like Professor Richard Dawkins, one of the world's leading atheists, very outspoken evolutionist, fairly intelligent scientist. He wrote the book called The God Delusion. Here's one of his quotes from a different source. He said, it's absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. Another dogmatic statement from a very intelligent scientist. So how would you, or your children, grandchildren, whomever, respond sitting in a class where the teacher or professor makes a statement like that? I guarantee you if the student raises their hand and says, yeah, I don't really believe all this evolution stuff, they're instantly broadcasting to everyone around them, I'm one of these ignorant people. I don't know anything about science or anything. I just believe the Bible. <laughs> Who's going to want to respond that way? I didn't. I grew up in a very strong Christian household, but I would not have responded that way in grade school, junior high, high school, even college. I was very shy. Kind of knew what I believed, but I really didn't know why, so I would have just been very quiet, very embarrassed. And so, again, this is happening. These students are being barraged by all this, and they really don't know how to respond. But we as Christians, we need to view everything around us through what we call biblical glasses. Now, glasses help us see things correctly, what this means is, what does God's Word tell us about God's world? Whether it's astronomy, biology, geology, anthropology, the Ice Age flood, dinosaurs, whatever it is, what did God tell us in His Word about any of those things? But evolution implies that the Bible does not represent real history. You can't trust it. Well, that's a big problem for us as Christians if we can't trust the history that's in the Bible. And it taints how we look at things. In fact, if you consider these things here, we've got the American Civil War, Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, the fall of the Roman Empire, and World War II. What are those things? Well, those are historical events. Okay? Where do we typically learn about them? Public schools, state universities. Okay? What about these here? We've got Jonah and the whale, parting the Red Sea, Noah's Ark, flood, Adam and Eve in the garden. What are those? Well, those are Bible stories. Where do we learn about those? Church, and Sunday school. Sometimes we'll have a little flannel graphs there for the kids, and they can come up and stick the animals in there. It's kind of fun for them. One thing I've noticed about kids is if we feed them at least every other day, that's what we do to save money, um, <laughs> they eventually grow up, and they start thinking for themselves. And then they run into teachers who will say, there's no way, way that there was a flood. How in the world did Noah get every single animal on this planet on that ark? Now, that's not what the Bible teaches, but that's what the teachers will think that the Bible says, and then the students will picture that ark in their mind thinking, I, I didn't really think about that before. They're right. There's no way you could fit millions of species of animals on that ark. And the teacher or professor will continue. And where did all that water come from to flood the entire planet? Can anyone here tell me how much water is required to flood the entire planet? No, I didn't think so. And even if the world was flooded with water, where did it all go? I'm looking around, I don't see it. And the students again say, I hadn't thought about that either. I know, it didn't actually happen. It's just a story. It's just a story in the Bible to teach us about, I don't know, boats, animals, water. It's it's a cool story, come on. I mean, you've got to love the story, even if it didn't happen. I mean, Jesus told stories, right? So this is probably a story, too, because we know it didn't happen. So you throw that out, and you throw other things out. And if you're going to throw anything in the Bible out, you're certainly going to throw creation in six days out. I mean, come on, nobody believes that. That's crazy. Yeah, everything was created in six days. That's silly, right? So they throw that out, too. Well, it's interesting to note that pretty much every major doctrine we believe as Christians is founded in the book of Genesis. For example, we have the doctrine of sin. What is sin? Well, God created the universe and the earth and Adam and Eve, and they were perfect. But Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. That's what sin is. It's disobedience to God. It goes back to Genesis. Then we have death. Why is there death in the world? Death is all around us. Where would that come from? Well, God created Adam and Eve in the garden. They were perfect, but they chose to sin and disobey God. And the consequence of their sin was that it brought death and a curse into his perfect creation. Death goes back to Genesis. Then we have marriage. Marriage is one man, one woman for life. That's highly controversial in this country today, even in many churches. Where would that come from? Well, God created Adam and Eve in that garden. It was perfect, and they said it's going to be one man, one woman for life. 
goes back to Genesis. And we have clothing. I notice you're all wearing clothes here this evening. That's good. <laughs> this is kind of weird, but you ever wonder why you put clothes on? Yeah, right now you guys think it's cold out, so you want to be warmer. But when it is perfect weather out there, super nice, why bother? Because God created Adam and Eve in that garden. They were perfect, but they sinned and brought a death and curse into God's creation. And clothing was a temporary covering for their sin. It was instituted back in the garden in Genesis. The reason we wear clothing goes back to Genesis. Then we have work. Why did we work? Because God created Adam and Eve in that garden. He said, Adam, I want you to work the ground, till the earth. Now, it got a lot harder for him once he sinned, but it was actually ordained by God right from the beginning. It's a good thing. Then we have Jesus. Jesus is referred to as being the last Adam. If the first Adam never happened, that was, you know, it's just a made-up thing. What does that say about the last Adam? And then most importantly, the gospel message. What is the gospel message? That Jesus Christ came, died on a cross, and rose again the third day. Why? Why did he do that? Because God created Adam and Eve in that garden. It was perfect, but they sinned, disobeyed God, brought death and curse into God's creation, and the shed blood of Jesus Christ is the only permanent solution for that problem. <laughs> the gospel message starts back in Genesis. If we have problems with Genesis, we have problems with pretty much everything we believe as Christians. So I hope you can start to see this Genesis stuff is kind of important. <laughs> it's not some miscellaneous historical detail in the past that no one really looks into anymore. It doesn't matter anyway. It's foundational to everything we believe. In fact, if Genesis is not literal history with a literal very good creation and a literal Adam and Eve, then sin did not literally enter the world through their actions, and you and I don't literally need to be saved. <laughs> so it's just, it's intricate to the rest of the Bible. Everything starts in Genesis. Nothing makes sense without Genesis taken as literal history. Here's one other quote from another atheist. I think this quote is very disturbing. But I also think it's very logical. This is what he said. He said, Christianity has fought, still fights, and will continue to fight science to the desperate end over evolution, because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve in the original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. And I agree with that. If evolution is true, as they're teaching it in the school system, and Christianity is not true. If evolution is true, there wasn't an original garden, perfect paradise with Adam and Eve in it, who sinned and ticked God off and got kicked out, and God says, oh great, now I've got to send my son to die for their sins. That didn't happen if evolution is true. Now I know many, many Christians put the two together. I got the solution. God used evolution. Case closed. End of story. It sounds like a great solution on the surface. Because God's all powerful, right? He can do whatever he wants. What do we care what he did, you know? So that allows you to say, whatever the scientists tell us, fine, bring it on. We'll just say that's how God did it. Well, I have a rubber stamp with the word God on it. Whatever they say, oh, yep, God did that. Oh, yep, God did that. Oh, God, God did that. And I think most of the Christians that I know who believe that are very sincere. They, they think it's a good solution. But if they were to look into it further, they would find out they're taking a very bad scientific idea, evolution, cramming it into the Bible and producing really bad theology and errors and contradictions. And we'll touch on that just very briefly. It'd be a whole other talk that I give, but it's not a good solution just to put, put the two together. It's actually worse. Um, Psalm 118.8 says, It's better to trust the Lord than to put confidence in man. And 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Meaning the most brilliant scientists we have on this planet, and some of them are just off the charts brilliant, they know nothing compared to God. We need to trust God for what he tells us, and we can. True science always backs that up. Since we are talking about evolution here, we need to define it. Because this word is used in so many different ways. For example, they will talk about the evolution of the Corvette, how it's changed over the years, and I'm old enough to know, yeah, it has changed. But it didn't change by accident each time, one into another one. It was designed, but they'll call that evolution. I actually don't have a problem with that. They want to call that evolution. That's fine. That's just not what I'm talking about when I mention evolution. I'm also not talking about different types or horse science. We see these all the time. Nobody debates that. It's a fact of science. But this, and 8 billion years into every other life form on this planet by accident over millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years. 
That's what they're teaching in the school systems, public school systems, state universities. This, I personally believe, is just a story told about the past. There is no scientific evidence for this. And we'll look at this just a little bit here. However, it's really, really easy to understand, and it's going to really, really help you sort through this whole in a really short period of time. Here's the point. Operational science and historical science. Operational science, space shuttles find cures for diseases. It's great debating operational science. Say, well, you Christian, almost every major Bible believing Christian. <laughs> and many scientists know that. They don't want science owes its origins to Christian. That doesn't mean you don't, but that has nothing to do with science. And it deals with events that happened in the unobserved past, like a supposed Big Bang. They say 13.8 billion years ago. You know what? Nobody was around to see that happen. They can't reproduce that in a laboratory, and they can't test that directly. But the same thing goes for the six-day creation account, right? I mean, we weren't around to see that happen. We certainly can't reproduce that in a laboratory, and we can't test it directly. It's a one-time event that happened in the past. So both of these views, Big Bang evolution or six-day creation, they fall into the category of what is known as historical science. Now, there's actually nothing wrong with historical science. It's just very different. It involves a lot of guesses and assumptions as to what happened a long time ago when we weren't there to see it. And different scientists have different guesses and assumptions. For example, a Christian kind of has a leg up because we have an eyewitness account from God himself, who was there, who was all-powerful, doesn't lie, and he created everything. He told us a fair amount about his creation. Not every single detail, but a fair amount. And we use that as a framework then to try to fill in other details of the past. When we're doing some guesses and assumptions, we use the framework of Scripture to try to help us. An atheist, on the other hand, would say, well, there's no God, so whatever happened in the past, it had to be an accident. It had to be just natural stuff, no, nothing else going on. So he or she would use that framework to formulate their guess eyes. In fact, you've heard it stated that the facts speak for themselves. Every fact you've ever heard or ever will hear has to be interpreted to give it any kind of meaning. Because And what we do is we use our current belief system, systems, our world, we call them our worldviews, our biases, our presuppositions. We use what we already believe to be true. We use that to interpret the facts. In fact, all scientists have the exact same facts because they're all living on the same planet. It's not like evolutionists. They've got their facts. Creationists, we've got ours, and we're throwing them back and forth at each other or weighing them who's got more. Or, no. All scientists are living on the same planet. They're looking at the same dirt, the same DNA. They have the same facts, but they're interpreting these facts differently, not based on the facts. They're interpreting them differently based on their worldviews, what they already believe. For example, it is an absolute fact that there are many layers in the Grand Canyon. Nobody doubts that. This is a fact. Those layers are there. An evolutionist would look at those layers through a filter or worldview of evolution, and they would look at the layers and say, wow, that would take millions and millions of years to accumulate all those layers through slow natural processes. A Christian or creationist can look at the exact same layers through a filter or a worldview of God's word and say, you know what? That's what I would expect to see. Because the Bible tells us there was a worldwide flood, Genesis 6 through 8. What would a worldwide flood do? A worldwide flood would lay sedimentary layers down all over the planet, probably filled with fossils because it would be burying whatever was alive. Guess what we see? Sedimentary layers all over the planet, filled with billions of fossils. <laughs> so they're looking at the exact same facts, coming up with two totally different interpretations. Not based on the facts, based on their starting points, their worldviews. Now, a quick side note about the Grand Canyon. I mentioned I'd done a tour with another scientist last year. Um, it was a great trip. How many of you have never been to the Grand Canyon? A number of you. Really go sometime with a creationist group. If you go to the stand, you know, standard tours, they're going to give you all the stories about millions of years and all that. But if you can, it is phenomenal. It, it's literally, literally breathtaking. You go and you see this. It's not just a big hole in the ground, but you go and you see it through the light of God's Word, and you will see physical evidence of catastrophic deposition of these layers. We, we give talks all along the way. One day we are walking along the rim, and you're looking one mile down to the bottom of the canyon at the Colorado River. I'm actually afraid of heights, but I thought, well, I shouldn't worry because the canyon's not high. It's just really deep. <laughs> um, 
So you're walking along the rim the first day, and it's not rock climbing or repelling. And then the next day, we're actually down on the river in you know, these rafts there. And it's crystal clear sailing. It's not white water after you're falling out of the raft. Now, some of you guys probably like that, but um, it's purposely meant f for anyone to go. We had a couple last year that was about eight years old, and we had some you know, early grade schoolers, so anyone could go. Uh, so if you're interested, you can go to our website and grab one of my cards and get some information. We're doing it in July and October. Uh, this year, but it's just very powerful. You actually see the original creation rocks. That must have been part of God's original creation in those six days. And then you'll see where all the layers start, and you'll, you'll see evidences that they must have been laid down catastrophically during the flood and not slowly over millions and millions of years. We were going to use this flyer here, but <laughs> we thought we wouldn't fill the bus if we did that. So it's actually a very, very safe trip. So but back to our story here. Um, facts. Similarities between ape and human skeletons. An evolutionist looks at that and says, see, this is proof or at least strong evidence that we've evolved from an ape-like creature because look at those similarities there. Whereas a Christian or a creationist can look at the same skeletons and say, you know what? That's what I'd expect to see because they were designed by the same designer, living on the same planet, eating similar foods and all that. So there's got to be some similarities, and that's what we see. Once again, exact same facts to totally different interpretations based on their worldviews or starting points. How many of you have ever heard of Rudyard Kipling? Many of you have. Great children's author, wrote a number of books like How the Camel Got Its Hump and How the Leopard Got Its Spots. They call these just so stories. It just so happened that this is how those spots got onto that leopard. They're very creative, imaginative, made up stories for children. They're entertaining, kind of fun. But we don't want to see just so stories in science. But too often that's exactly what we see. Here's a quote from Geo Times talking about these just so stories. It says, evolution is the same science that sent people to the moon and cures diseases. It's not. The science behind evolution is not empirical, but forensic. It's not that operational science that they're doing in the laboratory where they can repeat it over and over. It's trying to make guesses as to what happened a long time ago when nobody actually saw it. It goes on to say this. Because evolution took place in history, its scientific investigations are after the fact. No testing, no observations, no repeatability, no falsification, nothing at all like physics. I think this is what the public discerns, that evolution is just a bunch of just-so stories disguised as legitimate science. That's been my experience now for 30 years. I hear a lot of interesting stories, but no real science to back it up. For example, we have just-so stories about the origin of the universe. It just so happened 13.8 billion years ago, there's this massive explosion that formed our nice orderly universe. I go into a lot more detail on this in one of my other talks, but for tonight, jumping to the end of this one, Leon Letterman, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, said when you read or hear anything about the birth of the universe, somebody's making it up. He's not saying everyone's lying about it. He's saying they don't know. They have to make things up. They weren't there. They don't know. And we have just those stories about the origin of life. It just so happens 3.8 billion years ago, non-living chemicals came together to form a living cell. I love that story. <laughs> There's no real science behind it. I go into more detail on that in one of my talks. Ken Nielsen from USC here said, nobody understands the origin of life. If they say they do, they're probably trying to fool you. <laughs> this is a huge, huge problem for evolutionists. They, they don't have a clue. They talk a lot, but there's nothing concrete how chemicals could possibly come together and be alive and learn how to reproduce themselves. Then we have just those stories about the complexity of life. They say, yes, all living things are very, very complex, but they all just happen by accident. It's interesting, a typical human adult has up to 100 trillion cells in their body. And each one of those cells is actually more complex than the space shuttle. In fact, in a baby from conception to birth, a baby adds 15,000 of these cells to its body every minute. And each one of those cells is more complex than the space shuttle. <laughs> Now, inside the cell, the nucleus, that's where the DNA is. The DNA is like that coiled up ladder there. That's like a very, very, very com complex blueprint with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of information on it. In fact, there's so much information on your DNA. If you had just a pinhead amount of DNA and could write that out into book form, it would fill enough books to stack from the Earth to the moon 500 times. That's 240,000 miles from the Earth to the Moon, and just a pinhead amount of your DNA would span that distance 500 times. But you know what? It's just an accident. 
That's just what nature does. In fact, the public school systems and state universities will take your tax dollars and mine. They will teach the students they're nothing but an accident. The students, including the Christians, will end up walking away from whatever they believe, and we say thank you very much. We're in a sense like paying them to help them walk away from their faith. Now, you know whose fault it is that these kids are walking away? Here's, here's why they're walking away. Because every single teacher in the public school system and every single professor at the state university, they're evil, rotten, nasty people. <laughs> now, I don't mean that at all. I think that they're very nice people. And they're good teachers. They're not trying to lie to anybody. They're just teaching the only thing they've ever learned. They went through the public school system themselves usually, and they learned about evolution. Then they said, you're all going to go to college. What do I want to do? I think I'd like to be a teacher. I kind of like biology. I'm going to be a biology teacher. So they go get a degree to be able to teach biology. They get a degree. They get a job. They got the, the biology textbook, which teaches evolution. So that's what they teach. They don't know it's not true. They, they believe it's true. So again, they're not trying to lie to anybody. It's not their fault that the student, Christian students are walking away. They play a part in that process, but it's not like they're conspiring, conspiring to do that. You know whose fault it is? It's Pastor Marco's fault. Because <laughs> the kids get messed up, and the reason they come to church is so he can fix them, right? And then they go home, they get messed up again, so they got to come back the next Sunday, he gives them another booster shot or whatever. No, it's not his fault. I think it's largely our responsibility as parents to be mentoring our children God doesn't say, you know, hey, parents, if, if you get a chance, I don't know, maybe say something to your kids about the Bible or God or whatever. No, he commands us to be talking to them when they rise up, when they sit down, when they lay down, all these things, to be giving them reasons why we believe what we believe. Now, the students themselves do have some responsibility too, but I think it starts with the parents to be teaching them God's word. So getting back to my talk here, we also have just those stories about the, uh, the variety of life we have, the evolution of the species out there. Uh, how many of you ever heard of the peppered moth? A few of you have. This is one of the best evidences for evolution. And the students who are here, I'm, I'm guessing most of you are probably in the public school systems, if you have a course on biology and they start talking about evolution, be looking for this. Be looking for the peppered moth in your textbook. Here's how it goes. We have a tree trunk up here that has two moths on it. The tree also has a fungal growth on it called lichens, so it makes it a little bit lighter color. So the lighter moth in the triangle there blends in very well. It's camouflaged. The darker one sticks out like a sore thumb. So the birds are flying over and they're hungry and they're swooping down and they're picking off those dark colored moths. They're easy to see. So after a while, we don't have very many dark ones left, mostly light colored ones. Then the industrial revolution occurs Pollution goes up into the atmosphere, the trees become darkened, and now guess what? Now the dark ones blend in very well, but the light ones stick out like a sore thumb. Well, birds are still flying over and they're hungry, so they're swooping down and they're picking off the light colored moths. So now we have very few light colored moths, but a lot of dark colored moths. There's proof of evolution. If you don't quite get that, you're in good company, because when I first heard that, I didn't get it either. I thought, wait a minute, initially we had light and dark colored moths, afterwards we had light and dark colored moths. <laughs> it's not like you had a light colored moth that evolved into a dark colored moth, and even if it did, it's just a moth. <laughs> but the most interesting thing about this is, it never even happened. A scientist literally took some dead moths, glued them to the trees, took the pictures, put it in the textbooks, and told the story. And it's still in many textbooks today. My daughter is a freshman in college, but when she was a freshman in high school, she came home from school one day and said, hey, Dad, guess what they're talking about in school today? The peppered moth. My son came home last year from college and said, hey, Dad, guess what they're talking about in the university today? The peppered moth. I gave my kids an article to take to the teacher and the professor. I said, do this very respectfully. I said, your teacher and the professor probably don't even know that this never happened. So just let them know. They might want to take that into consideration. The leading scientists know it didn't happen, but it doesn't trickle down to the school systems, teachers, and textbooks. Then we have just those stories about the origin of man. I go into more detail of this on a different talk, but uh, they changed their story over and over and over. They used to say we evolved from a chimpanzee, and then they saw there's no evidence for that, so then they just say, okay, well, a chimpanzee and a human have a common ancestor. So we, we both evolved from something else that split off, went into the chimps and apes and things, and the other one went into the hominoids and ape men and, you know, and modern man and all that. So they keep changing their story constantly, constantly, you know, over and over and over, but it's part of another talk. 
Then we have just those stories about the concept of millions and billions of years. This one's more controversial, especially within the church. Um, but just as a reminder, I mentioned I have degrees in physics and engineering and I've been researching and lecturing for 30 years. So what that means is that I am right about everything I believe. <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing again, because it doesn't mean that. The only thing that that means is that I should probably have an opinion by now. It doesn't mean I'm right. It just means 30 years, you should probably have some sense about that. So that's all you're going to hear from me, is my personal opinion. I'm convinced there are only two things that anyone here tonight needs to figure out the truth in this area or even other areas. Just two things. One would be a copy of God's Word, and this is what it looks like on the inside, in case you're curious. It's another joke. The second thing is the Holy Spirit. If you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit can guide you into all truth as you read God's Word. There's one thing here that nobody needs tonight to figure out the truth, and that is me. You don't need some supposed expert coming along saying, trust me, I have degrees and blah, blah, blah. No, I don't want you to trust me. I want you to question absolutely everything you hear from me against your understanding of God's Word. If you're out there studying God's Word and praying about it, and you come to a different conclusion than I have, I have a lot of respect for you. Because you did it on your own. You read Scripture, and that's what you felt led to believe. I'll have more respect for you than someone else who says, well, I guess I believe in that six-day thing because that's what Jay said, and he sounds smart, I guess. No, don't have faith in me. Have faith in God's Word. And the more you study it, the more He helps you understand it. Sometimes along the way, your mind has changed because your previous belief wasn't really based on knowledge of Scripture. It was kind of your own idea with a little bit of Scripture here or there. The more we study, the more we understand. So you can't go wrong by that. You can go wrong by just blindly, but that's what I'm encouraging you to do. With that, I'll just give you a few very brief reasons, millions of years, either biblically or scientifically. I have a whole other couple lectures on this, but just for tonight, here's an example. The layers in the earth, we've been talking about them. That's a fact. Those layers are really there. Nobody doubts that. The standard story is that these layers have accumulated over about 540 million years. You know, the layers in this that story. We find multiple layers. These are fossils of trees. So let's say 100 million years ago, and then that tree stands of years waiting for the other layers to eventually bury it. It's physically impossible. The tree would have rotted away before those other layers got there. And take a look at the bottoms of these trees. They're missing something. We like to call them root systems. <laughs> these trees weren't growing there. They were growing somewhere else. They were catastrophically uprooted and torn away from their root systems and rapidly redeposited here in a single event like the global flood. Sometimes we find these trees laying sideways, <laughs> sometimes upside down. They obviously weren't growing there. Here's an actual photograph of a polystrate fossil tree going up through multiple layers. We don't have time to talk about Mount St. Helens, but in 1980 when it erupted, it laid down hundreds of feet of layers in hours and days. It didn't take hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years. It took one relatively small volcano a very short period of time. But then we have coal. So this just totally disproves everything I just said, right? Because we know coal is hundreds of millions of years old, right? Well, that's what you've been taught. <laughs> you can form coal in a laboratory in about four hours. <laughs> just takes heat pressure, water, and organic material. That's exactly what the flood would have provided. The flood would have buried all the vegetation on the earth under all those layers. Those layers would have pr produced a lot of pressure. Pressure causes heat, and then you got all the water from the flood. That organic material would turn into coal seams totally on its own in a few hundred, a few thousand years tops. It doesn't take millions of years. Then we have C14, carbon-14. It's a whole another talk that I give, but in a nutshell, carbon-14 is radioactive and it decays away. And it only takes a number of thousands of years before it's completely gone. Well, if coal is hundreds of millions of years old, there wouldn't be any carbon-14 left in it because it would have decayed after you know, a few thousand years. We have yet to find a single piece of coal on this planet that doesn't still have carbon-14 in it, which would tell us all the coal must be relatively young, a few thousand years old tops, not millions of years old. Um, and here's one biblical or theological reason why I just I cannot accept the millions and billions of years. We've got the Garden of Eden there in Adam and Eve. And Eve is saying to Adam, oh, Adam, this is such a perfect world. And then Adam says, yes, Eve, it's very good, just like God said, Genesis 1.31. 
We're all familiar with the Garden of Eden in a couple chapters there in Genesis. But if we as Christians say, you know what, my God is all-powerful and he could do whatever he wants and I believe he used the Big Bang and it doesn't matter anyway. And again, many Christians do that very sincerely thinking it solves something. If that is our mindset though, this is what you're going to see in the next click of this slide. It's probably going to be the most powerful slide of the evening and I, I get a lot of comments from this next slide because it opens a lot of people's eyes. If we say that God used the Big Bang and God is all powerful, he would not had a, have had a problem in physically doing it. It comes down to what did he tell us he did and then also what, did it, what does it look like. Um, but if God used the Big Bang, this is what we would see. Beneath Adam and Eve, beneath that garden, are all the layers in the earth. That's a fact. Those layers are there. Anyone can go see them. These layers are literally filled with billions and billions and billions of fossils. That's why we call it the fossil record. Why does that matter? Well, what's a fossil? A fossil is a remain of a dead thing. If these layers did accumulate slowly over hundreds of millions of years through you know, Earth history as God's forming this planet, that means that there were creatures living back then, dying, getting buried, that represents death, disease, pain, suffering, bloodshed, mutations, cancer. We have evidence of cancer in dinosaur bones. So apparently all that garbage was going on for hundreds of millions of years as God's forming this planet, and then when it's done, he plants a nice garden on top of the whole thing. And Adam and Eve are saying, oh, this is such a paradise, you know, it's a perfect world. No, it's not a perfect world. They're literally living on top of a graveyard of billions of dead things. So then when you happen to be reading the New Testament, in Romans 5.12, that says it was by Adam's sin that brought death into the world, you have to say, well, okay, it says that, but that can't be true because we know death was around for millions of years before Adam was even here. It's not Adam's fault that death is here. That's part of God's process. If it's not Adam's fault that death is here, then Jesus Christ wasted his time dying on a cross. The whole reason Jesus died was because Adam's sin brought death into the world. But if you just want to glibly say, well, God used a Big Bang, doesn't matter anyway, it matters. You just lost your gospel message. Tell someone that they need to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. They'd say, why? Well, because you're a sinner and, you know, Jesus died for your sins. And they, they could say, no, 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 it's not my fault. Your God created all that death. You know, when Adam sinned, that didn't change anything. Death was already around. So this is just a huge reason, and there's others too, that I just, I don't, I'm not willing to squeeze that in, and we don't need to. If we had time to talk about all the science, you'd see you don't have to be intimidated. They haven't proven the earth is billions of years old. There's so many physical evidences showing it can't possibly be billions of years old. So wrapping this up, Psalm 119, 160, the King James says, Thy word is true from the beginning. Genesis is the beginning of God's word. If we can't trust God for what he tells us about the beginning, how can we trust him for anything else? There was a service in which the pastor told the congregation that Genesis doesn't mean what it says. And this was a, a conservative church where this was happening. He said, Genesis doesn't mean what it says. And then he went on to talk about science. Oh, we've discovered all these things. We realize it just, you know, it doesn't really mean that. Afterwards, a nine-year-old girl asked her mom, if Genesis doesn't mean what it says, when does God start telling the truth? That's an interesting question. She just wanted to know. At what point can we trust it, you know, but before that, uh, not, not really. I've been looking for a while, and I think I found the reference. It's Genesis 1.1. <laughs> From that point on out, you can trust God's word. Even though this is God's first shot at writing a book, I think he did a pretty good job. <laughs> and you can trust it from cover to cover. So uh, with that, it's all about the ultimate authority of God's word. It's not about the creation evolution controversy. Not really. It's about trusting God's word and going to God's word first to see what he said and then trying to understand the world around us, rather than turning on the TV and some scientist says something, and now you, quote, know that, and now you take that knowledge and you go to God's Word to figure out what he really meant and tell God what he really meant apart from what he actually said. And it's about being ready with an answer, First Peter 3.15. Again, this isn't a suggestion, it's a command, and we need to do that so we don't have 50 to 75% or 80 or more of our own kids walking away from their faith. So we need to equip ourselves... There are so many great resources out there today. When I was younger and started researching, there weren't very many resources at all. Today we have a lot of them. As I close here, before we take a break and then do some Q&A, I'm just going to highlight the resources that I brought along. You don't have to buy my resources, but get something somewhere. Um, I've got nine individual DVDs 
um, the reddish one here, that's the exact talk that I just gave right now. All the slides, bad jokes and everything. I try to keep my talks very similar to the DVD so that if someone gets one, they know what they're going to get because I used to get frustrated. I'd hear someone give a talk. It was awesome. I'd buy their stuff, go home and watch it, waiting for the one thing I wanted to hear again, and it never came up. It's like, ah, oh, that's what I wanted to hear. So we got nine DVDs. They were recorded in a professional TV studio, so they're very professionally presented. So if you lend them out to anybody, too, they're not going to say, oh, what's this? Um, so we've got those titles on different things, dinosaurs in the Bible, how do we know the Bible's the inspired word of God, creation in six days, top ten questions, and, and a bunch of other DVDs there. Then we have, uh, well, actually, I think I ran out of this one. I was looking at the table. We don't have it. It must have sold out. We have a 12-session seminar series where we took five of, those D, of the nine DVDs, shortened up the talks, we made 12 half-hour sessions, and put a study guide in there with follow-up questions for each one. So uh, if anyone really wants that, they can get it off our website. It's all available there. And then the book that I wrote came out about a year ago, and I've been told by uh, some of the world's leading creation scientists, I think it's probably the best overview that's out there right now, and I was honored to hear that. Really easy to understand, very comprehensive, covers a lot of stuff, but but easy to understand. There's practical application chapter, and okay, what do you do with all this information? There's a chapter in there that I entitled, The Most Important Chapter. So when you look at the table of contents, you see that the most important chapter. Why did I do that? Because what, what are you going to do? You're going to flip back to see what that is, right? It's the gospel message. So I don't want people to get hung up on talking about the Big Bang or dinosaurs or DNA through this so that we can be more confident when we share that gospel message. We don't go through this so you can go win an argument about creation and evolution. It's about being confident and sharing your faith. So that's available out there. And then I have seven little pocket-sized booklets that I wrote. Most of this information is in the book. I wrote these first, and then I wrote the book later, and I included this information. But some people don't want to read a whole book, so, but they will read a little booklet on dinosaurs or something. So those are there. And then I already mentioned the newsletter, so I won't go over that again. Um, also, very quickly, I mentioned I've been speaking for 30 years, have never charged a penny, and we never will. But the main way our ministry moves forward is through our monthly supporters. Uh, I personally believe that your first and foremost financial priority is to your local church here. Yes. But beyond that, if, if you think this message is important and you want others to hear it, if you decide to become a monthly supporter of our ministry, we want to give you a free set of DVDs um, to take with you. Excuse me. I did two, uh, two video interviews yesterday out in the cold and in the rain, and I was afraid it was going to affect me. And then I haven't been getting sleep because I've been... My, my tour this time was just crazy. I got into Ramona last night. I got to bed at quarter to two, which in Wisconsin, that's quarter to four. And then I got up early this morning to speak, and I went right from the church there, <laughs> right here, and set up the table and came up here to speak. So the combination of being outside and not getting sleep, my immune system gets you know weak, and then you, that's, you get colds a lot easier. So uh, anyway, uh, with our monthly supporters, we're a nonprofit organization, so if you're interested, it's tax deductible. You can see us at the table there. We will give you the resources tonight to take with you if you're interested. But then something else, though, that anybody can do is you can help us get connected speaking other places. Most of you probably have a connection somewhere. Maybe you used to live in Utah or Florida or Wyoming or North Dakota or wherever, and you know the pastor there because you used to attend that church. Or maybe you have an uncle who is a youth pastor or wherever. What you can do is you can fill out this form. You put your contact information at the top, and then you just say, ABC Church Utah. We don't need the name of the church. We don't need the name of the pastor. We don't need his phone number, his email address, his social security number. <laughs> we don't need any of that. All we ask you to do is contact the person you know, your uncle, your former pastor, and ask me. That's all you have to do. You don't have to remember my background or where I'm from or how dumb I am or anything except a phone call. And if they say, sure, then you email or call me and say, okay, here's his name and here's his phone. I will call then. And a positive, encouraging message. It's very, very gracious message for, for skeptics. I'm very uh, gracious towards skeptics because God was gracious with me to help be patient with someone else who, most of the skeptics I meet, they're, again, they're not trying to lie about anything. They, they got real questions. And we did Q&A, and right when we did Q&A, this group of about five or six people in the back stood up were angry. And they were rude. They were very rude. And they just finished. And I said, you know what? Time out of your day to hear me go blah, blah, blah to them so that other people could hear the questions, and then they'll be able to hear the answers, too. And then I just answered the questions. I didn't say anything about them. I didn't say, oh, you guys are rude or anything. Just totally diffused the situation. Um, so 
that's how I deal with it. So no one has to worry about lending out the DVDs or having me speak somewhere because I'm going to be very welcoming to those who are skeptics and seeking and all that. Um, so anyway, that forms at our table back there. I mentioned our website, CEC. WISC, that's Creation Education Center, Wisconsin. And from it, you can see our speaking schedule. There's uh, short video clips on there, samples of our DVDs. There's you know, a lot of articles that I've written, all the questions of the month that I've been accumulating, all those are on there, and a bunch of other information. And you can also contact me through the website. I mentioned the Grand Canyon tour. You can grab one of our cards or go to our website if you want more information on that. And then just staying connected with the website. I will leave this up there during Q&A so that you can write it down in case you forget it or if you don't grab a card. But we're going to take a brief break and then we'll come back for Q&A. Yeah. So, Five right. minutes.